If you want to get your Bibles open, we're going to begin today in Exodus chapter 20. We're going to be all over Scripture today. Um, Last week's sermon on the Good Samaritan prompted me to take uh, this morning um, to examine uh, further the love of God, and that's what we're going to look at today. And so we'll begin in Exodus 20. I should tell you up front, we're probably going to look at about three or four times the number of Scriptures we usually look at, and um, so we'll be moving quite a bit today through the Bible. Uh, By way of introduction, 36 years ago, for those of you who are trying to do the math, that's September of 1984, I was sitting at the entrance of our school's cafeteria, and my role on that particular day was that I was to verify to make sure all the students were wearing acceptable attire in order to enter into the cafeteria. This was at Liberty Baptist College, and that meant no one was allowed to be wearing jeans. If you were wearing jeans, you were sent back to the dormitory to change clothes. Uh, It meant that young men were wearing ties. And by the way, it also meant that their hair was cut so it didn't touch their collar or their ears. Um, Some men had collars way down the backside of their back in order to have long hair on the backside. Young ladies to, to be wearing dresses. And this was called the Liberty Way. That was the name of the handbook that had all the rules for our Bible college on what you were supposed to do. Now, since about half the school is going to pass by me on that day, I decided to conduct the survey to pass my time and to just encourage all those who are waiting in line for their food. I had a piece of paper in front of me on the table that was in front of me, and at the top was a question, and beneath it there was space where they could write their answers. And the question at the top I borrowed from a song that came out months prior um, in 1984, for those of you who know your trivia. Oh, and by the way, we weren't allowed to listen to this song on campus, just so you know. But the title of the song and my question for the day is this, or was this, What's Love Got to Do With It? (laughs) And so they came through, they answered the survey, and it was just a fun exercise, at least I thought it was. I didn't know that later on I would use that survey when I was asked to preach a chapel in the springtime. Um, My text for the morning there at chapel was Matthew 22, in which we're instructed that the greatest commandment is to love God, and the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. Um, And I should tell you that it was a large group of people at our chapel. I think it was about 3,000 fellow students and faculty. And I found out later it also went out over the Liberty Broadcast Network, the radio station of the old-time Gospel Hour. And I tell you that because I also want to confess to you that three decades ago, Sufficient to say I managed to completely embarrass myself that day as I preached at chapel. I read the first part of the verse just fine about God's love, that we are to love God, and then I continued reading it this way. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your navel as yourself. (laughs) Now, to add insult to injury, I did this in front of a young lady that I had just met that I would later marry, and her dad, who traveled four hours to hear me preach for the first time. (laughs) So I thought today I would return to the question, what's love got to do with it? And what I'd like for us to, and by the way, I won't be quoting any of the lyrics that Tina sang back in 1984. I'd like for us to ponder, first of all, God's love for himself, and then God's love for us, then our love for him, and finally our love for one another. And I want to do all four of these because it's important for us to understand the connection between all of these, how they all work together. Uh, My sermon, as I've already mentioned, we're going to look at a lot of Scripture, a lot of truth statements today. Uh, But if you stick with it to the end, uh, when we return to the concept of the Good Samaritan, our need to love one another, I have some very practical applications. In particular, I want us to think uh, purposely about the thought of speaking the truth in love and some other elements along with that. And so today I want to begin with reading the two tablets um, that contain some of the details on how we are to love God with all our hearts, with all our souls, with all our minds, and then love our neighbors as ourselves. This is found in Exodus chapter 20. I want to read all the first 17 verses there of Exodus 20. So if you would please stand with me now for the reading of God's Word. As we are instructed by God, commanded by God, how we are and the, the fact that we are to love Him and love one another. Exodus 20, the Word of the Lord. Beginning verse 1, God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. 
You shall not make for yourselves a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation, to those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not covet, commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. I'd like to ask Denny O'Neill if you'd pray this morning as we look at God's Word. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to begin with an affirmation that I hope you can say amen afterwards. There is no higher love than God's love for himself. I'll say it again. There's no higher love than God's love for himself. If that's new to you, I would encourage you just to ponder that the rest of this day. God is love. He is the definition of love. And his love for himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is the exacting perfect example of love. Um, and what you see before you is called a triquetra, the symbol. It's a symbol that's been used classically of the Trinity. It was very popular in the 19th century in Celtic art. Um, but with the triquetra, with a circle with it, it tries to represent the idea of the unity of the Godhead, but also the diversity of the distinct persons within the Godhead. I point that out because we don't want to use images of God that reflect man because God is not man. But his love for himself is foundational between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if you want to think about the free flow of love that ter takes place within the Godhead, that might help you as you think about the fact that God reserves the highest affections for himself. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Spirit. The Spirit loves the Father. The Son loves the Father. The Spirit loves the Son. The Father loves the Spirit. The Father loves the Spirit and the Son. The Son loves the Father and the Spirit. The Spirit loves the Father and the Son. When you think about it, there are so many different ways that love can flow within the Trinity. And to understand the nature and intensity of their love for one another, there's a couple of passages that I think help us. First and foremost, go with me to John 17. John 17. John 17 is actually what should be called the Lord's Prayer. It's His high priestly prayer, including for you and I. Um, what we typically think of as the Lord's Prayer is the model prayer that's been given to us, but this is His prayer for us and for others as well. But the way it opens is a reminder of God's love for Himself. John 17, the first five verses. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up His eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Now notice this, glorify your Son. The Son is saying to the Father, glorify me that your Son may also glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life as, to as many as you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Now again, notice this idea of glory. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you've given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So God, 
the highest being, his purpose is to glorify himself. The Son glorifies the Father, the Father glorifies the Son, and I would say the Spirit is part of this as well. Now go to Exodus 34. Exodus 34. If you know your Bible history, we move from Exodus 20, and that is the first giving of the Ten Commandments, at least the tablets. In Exodus 34, there's the second giving, and you might say, why did the second, was the second given? You recall when Moses came down, he was angered by what the people had done, and so he broke the first set. And so in the giving of the second tablet, God states something that was also in the, the giving of the tablets. This Exodus 34, and I want you to see this, Exodus 34 down in verse 12. God says, take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, lest it be a snare in your midst. But you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. So what God is saying, when you enter in the land, I don't want you to enter into the pagan worship. I don't want you to enter into worshiping false gods. And he says the reason in the next verse, for you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. This is a very big statement. God says of himself, he informs his creation that he is jealous. For you and I, jealousy is a sin. If we go about saying it's all about me, that's selfish, it's wrong, it's sin. But for God to go about saying it's all about me is a glorious virtue. The highest supreme being, it's all focused on him. And therefore, we shouldn't be surprised when we read from the first tablet that ultimately we are to love God. And the specifics are these, no other God before him, do not make any idols, do not take his name in vain, and the day of rest, when he rested from creation, is a holy day. And by the way, these four elements that form the notion of loving God, this is not an invitation. God doesn't say, listen, if you got nothing to do next Tuesday, I'm inviting you to come over and love me. It's not a recommendation. He's not saying, listen, I think this is a good thing for you to do. These are the commandments of God. God commands his creation to love him, to worship him, to be enamored with him, for all the focus to be upon him. And he requires that his people know these details, and furthermore, that they teach them to their children, insisting that they too love God. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6 now. Deuteronomy chapter 6, just turn a couple of chapters couple of books. Deuteronomy chapter 6, you know this passage, and here it's explicitly stated that we are to love God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, again, this is to be something that you know and that you teach your children. Deuteronomy 6, beginning in verse 4, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God. Again, not an imitation, not a recommendation, a commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. And here it is. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. The love of God for himself is put on display especially between the Father and the Son that we might learn what true love is. And for the Son, his love for the Father was nothing less than perfect obedience to the will of the Father, to include, as we've already talked about, death, even death on the cross. And the love of the Father for the Son includes not just his statements that came twice from heaven, this is my beloved Son, both at his baptism and the Mount of Transfiguration, but think about his care for his Son as he promised in Psalm 16 that the one who became sin for us might not be abandoned to Sheol. This is the love of the Father, he who became sin for us, whom the Father could not look upon that sinful estate, he would not abandon his Son. And the relationship between the Father and the Son and their love for one another is our primary source to understand what love is and how it must be manifest if it is to be understood as true love, selfless love, sacrificial love, and sacred love. If you, if you want to ponder today something to think about, I think that perhaps one of the most critical examples of the love of Jesus for the Father is actually found in the Garden of Gethsemane. You recall in that hour how Jesus, his tears, it was like blood was there present. Jesus' love in that passage 
if I understand it correctly, is not so much focused on us as much as that is an eternal benefit and blessing to us. I believe that ultimately what is put on display is his love for his father, his commitment to be obedient to the father, knowing, please let this cup pass, but not my will, not what I desire, but your will be done. Jesus' obedience to the will of the Father to lay down his life for undeserving sinners in order that by the love of God for us as sinners, he might be able to lovingly bring saints holy and blameless before the Father as a gift. This is what I've brought to you as a gift, all ultimately to the eternal praise of the triune God. And we're going to pick that up in a moment, but let's move on before this sermon that grew out of last week's sermon grows into another sermon. Let's go on to God's love for us. Among the first verses that we memorize after we trust in Jesus Christ is probably John 3, 16. Can you say with me this morning? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Does it ever grow old? I mean, it takes us back if the Lord was pleased to save us when we were children, memorizing it back then, but as adults, it's just still so sweet, isn't it? God loved us. And God's love, here's what's important though, God's love for us is contingent and dependent upon his love for himself. If God did not love himself, he would not love us. Go with me to Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5. And this is a verse that I think I read last week. I, I reference it frequently, but in Romans 5, and in particular verse 8, it contains a, a very unique pronoun. And if you want to know the specific name of it, let me know. It's a small pronoun, but it's only used here in the New Testament. And it's a very significant pronoun in this particular passage. Romans chapter 5, and I'm going to begin in verse 6. And here's the contrast to keep in mind what we were, who we were before God saved us. For when we were still without strength, and keep that in mind, we were not able to come to God We didn't have the capacity to do it. In that estate, in due time, Christ died for whom? The ungodly. Not for those who were looking for God, but for the ungodly, enemies of God. For scarcely for a righteous man one will die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. And here's the verse. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But the pronoun that is used there speaking about God's own love, should be, more properly should be translated, but God demonstrates his own love for himself toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's love for himself toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I don't know that you could add much more to the gracious truth that God loved us while we were still sinners and Christ died for us while we were ungodly. But let me amplify with three thoughts. First of all, God's love for us, the love of the triune God for us, is for his glory. God's love for us, eternal benefit, is for his eternal glory. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I am amazed at how God coordinated a couple of things, and I didn't realize for this part until last night, and then a second part until this morning, that God was weaving together some beautiful things. I was going to turn to Ephesians 1. We've already heard it today. Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 3. and begin, So Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, speak about the triune God's work in saving us. First of all, the work of the Father who chose us, the Son who died for us, the Spirit who changes us and seals us for the day of redemption. And so we've already seen the work of the Father in choosing us. Again, before we did anything good or bad, nothing good that he foresaw in us, just his determination, his purpose. But why? Why did God choose us? Why did that take place? Look at verse 6. Here's what it states. Why? To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Why did God choose us? For his glory. Then why did the son die for us and why was his blood shed? Look at verse 12. We see the same thing that we who first trusted in Christ should be what? To the praise of his glory. So the father chose us again to save us 
for his praise. The son died for us, shed his blood. Why? For his praise. And the spirit works in us and seals us. Why? Look at verse 14. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to what? To the praise of his glory. Don't miss that. God's love for himself toward us all for his praise and glory. Theologians, Bible scholars, and just Christians sometimes ask really big questions. I'll give you one. Did God need to create anything? Did God need to create anything? And the answer is no, if you think there was something lacking in God, so he needed to create it in order to fulfill himself. Or that God was lonely, so he created so he could have something, some other being with him. He, he didn't need anybody else. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he doesn't need that. Same thing could be asked. Does God need to save anyone? And as weird as it sounds, there's nothing lacking in God. He doesn't save in order to fulfill himself or to make himself complete. However, God is a creative God and God is a saving God. So in order to amplify his glory, he creates and he saves and does it all again for his own good pleasure. It'd be kind of like asking, do you and I need to smile? Well, the answer is we don't need to, but there's something within us that overflows if we're happy or filled with joy, and so we smile. Likewise, God in creating and in saving, nothing lacking but an overflow of He is. The point is, the final object of salvation is not us. The final object of salvation is God Himself. He saves us for His praise and for His glory. To be enveloped in the love of God, how sweet. Next, God's love for us makes us attractive. In our prior estate, we were unlovely. It, it, we are not attractive to God until he saves us and sees us in his son, Jesus Christ. Which made me think now about what was shared about the child who was covered with mud and unacceptable. Because what I thought about prior today was the fact that pretty much every morning I get up and part of my routine is to go into the bathroom and then I look in the mirror and I think, my goodness, what has happened to me overnight? Because it's not attractive. <laughs> it is worse than being covered with mud. And it takes me a long time to put myself in this estate where I could be before you and you wouldn't go, oh, you're hideous, and turn away. However, my work in trying to get ready to be acceptable is nothing compared to the work of God to make us acceptable. It's not about soaps and shampoos and toothpaste. It is nothing less than the precious blood of Jesus Christ that washes us, that cleanses us, that makes us acceptable before Lord God Almighty. And he says, he bids us come. You are now clean and I can receive you into my presence. Again, the object is God, and we are attractive by the love of God. Number three, God's love for us, and this is the one where, I'll be honest with you, I wish I, wish I could tell you this wasn't part of the love of God, but the older I get, the longer I walk with my Savior, the more I'm convinced it is true, and it's important for us to know that the love of God for us includes our present suffering. For reasons, again, that we don't understand, God uses suffering to make us more dependent upon Him, to conform us more to the image of His Son, for us to be hugged up tight by Him in our hour of need and know His love for us once again. Uh, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I won't read all of this uh, here today because I want to read from 2 Corinthians 4 into chapter 5, but you can read about this later, some on your own. And for those of you who, who have experienced a, a degree of suffering or you're going through it right now, you'll understand this passage. And for those of you who have not yet tasted of the bitterness of suffering yet and the sweetness of God's grace in it, then let this passage prepare you for that day because it will come unless the Lord calls you home soon. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in 16. Paul writes and says, Therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, 
yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Right there, that's just sweet, isn't it? And for those of you who have dragged about a body that you know is dying as a believer, you can attest to this truth. You understand the frailty of, of what people see, but you also understand the beauty of what God is working in you for all eternity. Continuing on verse 17, this, this, this has to disturb us, doesn't it? For our light affliction, really? Really? Is that how we... How it's to be? Yes, it is. Because the contrast is what we endure here as great as it is compared to what glory has ahead of us. He wants us to try and have that right mindset. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment in the grand scheme of things, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Amen? It's important for us to know this, isn't it? when we're there and our, our affliction is light for a moment, but it seems like it won't go away and it's more than we can endure. And here's the key. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not, which are not seen are eternal. Now jump over to chapter 5 because I want you to see real quickly. He's not done with this theme. Verse 4 of chapter 5 for we who are in this tent, what do we do? <laughs> we groan. And some of you know what that is. By the way, all of creation does this as well, waiting for final redemption. We, it's just more than we can bear. And we cry out, being burdened. And it's not because we're longing to get out of here to be unclothed, but rather we do desire to be further clothed to get rid of this which is perishing, put on that which is not going to perish, to be, to be clothed with that which is mortality that may be swallowed up by life. And go down to verse 7 now. So in the meantime, we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yet well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. That's our desire. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to Him. Aren't these, aren't these verses important? It doesn't change what we suffer. It doesn't reduce the pain, but it does help us to respond in a manner that's pleasing to the Lord, to keep our eyes on Christ. And I'll be honest with you, the older I get, and from my perspective, the, the, the world gets harsher and harsher. I think this is important. It's important for us to be anchored to these truths. This isn't it. We're not, it's, this isn't it yet. And the Lord's grace will be sufficient. Which brings us now to our love for God. And let me remind you of what you know is true. We love Him because what? He first loved us. Again, this is all contingent. We cannot fulfill the commandments of the first tablet. We cannot truly love God if He did not first truly love us. I noticed this morning I was watching the news and, 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 a, and a pastor, a well-known pastor, writer, stole my thunder. If you watched the news this morning, was talking about this very theme. I thought, well, this is a good, good opening to get into my sermon. Remember what the Bible says, by this we know love that he laid down his life for us. Our love for him is dependent upon his love for us. And our choice of God is dependent upon God's choice of us. We would not have chosen him if he did not choose us. Go to John chapter 15. John 15. And as you're turning, we're getting close. We've got this passage and one more to go today. So we've covered a lot of territory today. John chapter 15. And by the way, Jesus in this instructing is wrapping all of these concepts together of our love for one another, uh, the love of God for us, our love for God. And we see that beginning in verse 12. John 15, verse 12. This is my commandment, again, a commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's own life for his friends. By the way, that packs a couple of sweet thoughts. He died for us, and we're his friend. He lets us be his friend. Verse 14, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask 
The Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. When our eyes are opened, we see how lovely he is. We're unlovely until he looks upon us with grace. But when we have grace, finally we see just how lovely he is. The God that we knew about, now by the grace of God, we know. And he is beautiful. And our love for God will be manifest in worship. That is to say, we will give him glory all the time, 24-7, 365 days a week. Our love for him should be expressed in worship that whatever we do, whether we eat or we drink or whatever we do, that we do it all for the glory of God. Now, don't negate, though, some key elements of worship. First of all, I, I hope every one of you seeks the Lord daily with some quiet time to be still and know that he is God to set aside that time, not just to lift up your request to the Lord, but that time of personal devotion to worship Him and to praise His name, to count your blessings and thank Him day by day. But also an important element is corporate worship. And isn't it great to be able to gather again? I mean, pray for those around the country that aren't able to do that with threats, but also continue to be in prayer for those around the world that, that constantly face life itself, life and death, to be able to worship. And, and pray for our, our, our brothers and sisters in Mexico. They're looking to be able to start gathering again, and the state has been very hostile down there. They're hoping the first part of October. And, and the pastor was reaching out to me and saying, could you tell me how to make the church feel inviting <laughs> and, how, and how people respond when they start to gather again? Because most of you remember it was, it was different that first time. But our corporate worship of God has to be a commitment We've got to be faithful. We've got to be loyal. We've got to be committed. And I mean particular to the local church. It's true we can worship God anywhere, but God has called us as a people to gather in the local church to worship him. And I want to challenge you, especially families, to be committed to this. Um, I was thinking about this through the years. I've never seen where relationships are strained, where relationships like between a husband and wife or between parents and children, where if they worship in different churches, it's benefited. If the relationships are strained, it almost always seems to cause further divisions. So I just challenge you to think about the corporate worship and the beauty of that as doing as a family. Now, again, there's a lot more that I could say, but let me move on to the last thought. Our love for one another. Our love for one another and for our neighbors. So we can have some application today and some particular things. Again, let's emphasize, we will not love one another if we don't love God, and we would not love God if he did not first love us. So you got all those connections. Because he truly loves himself and he truly loves us, we can truly love him and then truly love one another. Now, in my notes over the last umpteen weeks as I was thinking about these thoughts, I think I've got about 103 different things to say. Let's focus in on four. So I'm going to take off 99 of them. We'll do them some other time. I mentioned number one last week. Don't buy into the lie that you must first work on loving yourself in order to love others. That's a lie. No work is needed for us to love ourselves. We are really good at doing that already. I mean, just think about it. If we want something, what do we do? If we want it, in our world today, we buy it, we eat it, we watch it. And sadly, even as Christians, we will violate the commandments when there's something that we want. The second tablet will violate those commandments. If we want it, it'll consume us and we'll covet it. We will lie for it. We will lie with it. And we will steal to get it. We already know how to love ourselves. Instead of working on loving ourselves, remember what Jesus said? We are to deny ourselves and take up our crosses daily and follow him. Number two, loving one another is part of God's commandments. Again, we are not invited to love one another. It's not a recommendation. God commands us to love one another. Now, sometimes you might say, well, I'm thankful he didn't say I have to like everybody. You don't have to, but we are required by God's grace to love one another. And we're told in scriptures, if we love God, we will keep his commandments. John chapter 14, 1 John chapter 5. This will include especially fulfilling the roles that he has given us. And there are many roles that we fulfill. And each role needs to be done with sacrificial love. So if you're married, you're to love your spouse. 
just as Christ has loved you. If you're a parent, love your children. Children, with love, honor your parents. If you're someone's friend, be a friend like Christ is to you. If you're someone's boss, employee, if you're in charge or not in charge, demonstrate love. Now, in addition to that, if you feel like, I don't know what to do, there's a long list of one another's found in Scripture. There's a lot. And then if you feel like, boy, those are too many, then just pick two or three and work on a couple of these at a time in order to love one another. I think we got plenty to do, don't we? Now, granted, all of these things are probably focused primarily on the church, but a lot of these things should extend to outside. So number three, our love for others requires godly involvement in the world. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. And we should be people who are reaching out to one another. And, and first and foremost, if we truly understand the nature of our condition and people's loss of state, we'd be witnessing. This is an expression of love for one another. I hope that right now you could at least think of one person for whom you regularly pray for that you don't believe is a Christian. And I hope you're looking for creative ways to reach out to that person with the love of Jesus Christ. Now, let me throw a curve at you. Let me, th let me suggest another way to consider loving one another in our world today. And I want to mention the Green New Deal. And what I want to say about that is don't do that. Because that is actually the worship of the creation. But let me remind you of the old Green Deal. Old Green Dominion at creation where God said we're supposed to fill and subdue and have dominion over this world. This is our Father's world. And we should be first and foremost believers who take care of it, not to worship it, but to honor the Lord who has given it to us. So it might sound odd at times that it, we ought to be people who think about recycling. We ought to be people who think about maybe taking our own bags to the stores when we go shopping. We ought to be people who think about solar panels on our house. We ought to be Christians who think about the vehicles we drive and the frequency. These are all things for us to consider, not again to turn things upside down, but to honor the Lord who has given us so many rich blessings. And in, in addition to that, when we go out into the world, I mentioned this last week, to be like the Good Samaritan, who would defend the weak, the helpless, and care for those who are in need. I mentioned, I think, last week, but let me state it again. If you go out into society and you are respected in society, then be thankful for that. But if you see someone who isn't, then stand up for them. And remind whoever it is that's mistreating them or speaking down to them that they too are creating the image of God and they are worthy of respect. Do it with, do it with caution. Don't get me wrong. Don't, you're not looking for a fight. But we should be those who defend those who need to be defended in honor of the Lord who created all in his image. Which brings me to number four. We need to be a people who speak the truth in love. And I've been thinking about this for some time because I say it and you hear it and other people say it and we all need to know it, but what does it mean to speak the truth in love? And so I wanted to give you just a couple of thoughts that hopefully will help us to be able to speak the truth in love. First and foremost, we have to be spirit led because sometimes the best thing to do is to be quiet. But when we do open our mouths, we need to be led by the Spirit. With that being said, what is the goal of speaking the truth in love? For some people who know a lot about truth, they think it's about winning the debate. I'm going to come back and I'm going to nail them with the truth and I'm going to win and set all things right. I was talking with someone um, this week and it was such a delight. This individual was getting ready to enter into a conversation with somebody that was going to be a hard conversation. They needed to say some things that were going to be hard to be received by this other individual. And this person said, but as I was thinking about it, the reason I'm doing it is because I love this person and I want to see this person have a greater love for Christ and, and serve the Lord to a greater capacity. That's the reason why we speak the truth in love. Not to win, but that others might see Christ and see the beauty of our God and have a deeper love for him. So with that, let me give you three thoughts that came to mind by way of, by way of actually illustrations in Scripture. Number one, if you're going to speak the truth in love, do it with tact. Do it with tact. And the illustration that came to my mind is Nathan with David. You know the story. David really messed it up. He was stuck in sin. 
And he had not yet given up. And the Lord sent Nathan. When Nathan entered in the house, what did he do? He didn't immediately say, David, you're the man. You're the one. You're the problem. He used tact. He used an illustration that he knew would grip the king's heart as related to justice and even the idea of fairness and a concern for the weak. And then once he engaged him and with that tact to soften his heart, then he said, you're the man. The focus is on you. So use tact when you speak the truth in love. Pick your times to do it and know the individual. The next thought that came to my mind is courage. You have to have courage to speak the truth in love. And my illustration was Peter and John. Peter and John went to pray. They met a lame man on the way. You know the story. I sang it to you a couple weeks ago, right? And you recall that after they healed that man, they went before the leaders, the religious leaders. They were accused of doing wrong. And yet they had the courage, I find in the passage, to do four things. They're accused of doing wrong. And number one, they say, wait a minute, what we did was good. And everybody knows it. Everybody can see this was a good thing. Number two, it took courage to point them to Jesus the Christ. The gospel was presented in very simple forms in that passage. What we've done is good, and it was done in Jesus Christ's name for the good of another individual. The next thing is, they reminded those religious leaders, you should be reasonable. You make a judgment. You decide. Is what we did a good thing or a bad thing? You can figure it out. You have a mind with which to reason. And then number four, their courage was displayed because they stated whether you want us to do it or not, whether you consider it good or not, we must obey God. And that's courage, speaking the truth in love. We are going to do what God wants us to do regardless of what happens to us. Which brings me to the third one, and there's probably many more, but these three I hope will help us to have tact, to have courage, and then we need wisdom. We need wisdom when we speak the truth in love to make a connection with our audience, whoever that individual is. For this, go to Acts 17, and we'll close out with this passage in just a moment. Acts 17. Again, most of you I know know your scriptures. Acts 17, Acts 17. That's Paul. Where's Paul? He's in Athens, and he's speaking before a bunch of pagans at the Areopagus. And there he makes an appeal to what is common. So he has wisdom. He takes what's there, makes a connection in order to do all the things we're talking about with tact, to point out things that are not true, to point them to Jesus Christ. And he reminds them that after it's all said and done, God has given us a commandment. Now the commandment here is one of repentance, but repentance then leads to the next commandment to trust in Jesus Christ. And again, not invitations, not recommendations. These are commandments. And so Paul, speaking the truth in love, let's listen now to what he says. Acts chapter 17, we'll break in at verse 22. Acts 17, verse 22. And let this be our application for the day especially. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made of hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring." Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance, we might as well put ourselves in that category. God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained and has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. 
God's love for himself, his love for us, our love for him, our love for one another. It all works together, but it's all based upon the love of God for himself. May we praise him and worship him by truly loving him and loving one another. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. Thank you that you allow us to search all of scriptures, the whole counsel that you've given us, to be able to understand some things in a little bit deeper way than we would perhaps not understand. How great a God you are, and how great your love is for yourself. And this great love for yourself is toward us, and that while we were still sinners, your son died for us, that we might love you and love one another. I want you to, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed before we sing to, today, I'd ask you just to take a moment and ask the Spirit to reveal to you the degree still of selfishness where your, your energies and times are spent on loving yourself and where that needs to be turned to love God and to love others. Please just take a moment right now and ask the Spirit to work to help identify these struggles that all of us still face so that our love for him might be pure and for one another might be pure as well. And let's do this now in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.